Thank you so much for joining me for this video. As we begin this week's Parsha by Yikra, which means, and he called, which is also the first portion from the book commonly known as Leviticus, we observe how the Lord called to Moses and told him the details about the different sacrifices and offerings that were to be made in the tabernacle, whether they were animal sacrifices, grain, or drink offerings. As I prayed about this week's message, I felt led to make it about the calling of God on our lives. I understand this may be a message already commonly used for this portion, but I hope that I will be bringing it to you from different points of view than you may have ever seen before. I pray it is a blessing. Many of us have read or heard Romans 11.29, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. But why did Paul make that statement? In Romans chapter 11, Paul was writing to the members of the Roman congregations about the relationship between the Jews, or the children of Israel, and the Gentiles, also known as the nations, and the Hebrew word is goyim, that are grafted into Israel. In context, beginning in verse 11, Paul says, I say then, have the Jews stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. How could we be cut off? Aren't we once saved, always saved? I have heard many pastors and preachers say that this is one of the most terrifying passages in all of Scripture. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This is very interesting to me because Yeshua said lawlessness, and I wholeheartedly believe that he means without the law or without Torah. It is further illustrated by what is most important to God. The heart of the law, or the Torah, is evident in this next passage in Matthew 19. Now behold, one came and said to Yeshua, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Yeshua said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Yeshua said to him, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, 
for he had great possessions. Then Yeshua said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Yeshua looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Yeshua said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. What does it mean to follow Yeshua? There are two portions of the Jewish liturgical service that is almost totally universal among all sects of Judaism, Messianic or otherwise. The first one is called the Shema, which means hear and obey in Hebrew. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the second one is the Vehavta, which means, And you shall love. When I began my journey into Messianic Judaism, it was so exciting to hear the Shema and the Vehavta in the liturgy each week. And it was even more exciting when I came to the realization that Yeshua recited them word for word in the following passage. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that Yeshua had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Yeshua answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he, and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Yeshua saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. In that passage, the scribe told Yeshua that keeping the greatest commandment, the Shema, hear and obey, and the Vehafta, and you shall love, are more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So that begs the question, has the sacrificial system been abolished? Many of us have been told that since Yeshua died, the sacrificial system has been done away with. It would appear that in the book of Hebrews, since Yeshua made the perfect sacrifice, we no longer need a sacrificial system. However, as my hubby regularly points out, that section of Hebrews was just pointing out an update to the covenant of the priesthood, but it was not to abolish the sacrificial system per se, and it was definitely not doing away with the Torah. To confirm this, Paul the Apostle had taken a Nazarite vow and even offered sacrifices in the temple. In researching, I found an interesting article that goes a little more in depth regarding this fact. Years after the ascension of Christ, Paul observes the Nazarite vow. He was even instructed by James to keep the vow to prove that he is in observance with the law. This basically confirms that the so-called ceremonial law is still relevant. Furthermore, Paul proceeded with this to prove that he did not teach against circumcision or against the observance of the law altogether. He was not reluctant. All of this would be in vain if Paul supposedly denounced the law but still proceeded to observe the law. Why didn't Paul rebuke James for even making the suggestion? Why didn't Paul rebuke the Jews for still keeping vows and going through purification? Some might claim that only Jews have to keep the law. How can the law be abolished for the Gentiles who didn't have or observe the law, but not abolished for the Jews? This opposes the tenet of there being one gospel, one faith. Some claim that Paul only kept the law to minister to the Jews. If that's the case, then Paul is going against his own principles because he supposedly taught disciples to don't let people judge them for not keeping the law, yet he is appeasing the Jews because he doesn't want the Jews to judge him. Furthermore, Paul used the law to defend himself in court. How can he defend himself with something if he was preaching that it was abolished or irrelevant? With all being said, Paul can fall into three categories. One, a hypocrite. He told everyone not to keep the law and that it's abolished, yet he kept it as a valid law worthy of observing. Two, mentally unstable. He didn't have a coherent doctrine. For example, he circumcised Timothy so he can tell the others that if they get circumcised, they fall from grace. Or three, misunderstood. Paul did observe the law and didn't teach the abolishment of it. If he falls into the first two, then we should not listen to anything he taught because he is unreliable. What sayest thou? 
In answer to the question, in my opinion, it is the third option. Paul loved the Torah and was obedient to the best of his ability, and he called others to do the same. Follow me as I follow Messiah. Continuing, after the temple was destroyed, there was no way to perform the ritual sacrifices in the prescribed manner, so obviously the temple sacrifices had to come to an end. Be that as it may, contrary to popular belief, we are all still performing sacrifices today. Yes, you heard me correctly, I said all. Each animal that is slaughtered for meat is a type of sacrifice. Those sacrifices can either be made to God or to some other false god or evil spirit or even to the enemy. But it doesn't stop there. You may say, well, I don't eat meat. I'm a vegetarian. If you eat eggs or consume any type of milk product, those animals sacrifice part of themselves to give you those eggs or that milk. Others of us also say, I don't eat any animal products. I'm a vegan. I would like to venture to say that every grain, fruit, or vegetable that we consume is also a sacrifice. Even seeds are alive. Even though it is only plant life, it is still life. And when we eat any plant or part of a plant, it has sacrificed a part of itself or the whole of itself so that we can live. If we notice in nature that is the pattern of life and death, for there to be life, some other living thing must die. Composting is a great example of this. Dead matter goes back into the soil and makes the soil much richer and more productive. This spiritual truth is evident throughout the scriptures, but most importantly, our Savior gave his life so that we could have eternal life. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Thus we are to die to ourselves and live for him, which means sacrificing ourselves, our own desires, joys, and pleasures for the sake of others. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. To love God and love one another as he loved us. As such, he wants us to be a living sacrifice. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy or set apart, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua Messiah. How do we follow Yeshua? In the Gospels, Yeshua said, follow me, or it is reported that people followed him at least 29 times. What does it mean to be a follower or disciple of Yeshua. He said very clearly that we need to count the cost. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Last, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all those who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. We must all ask ourselves if it is personally worth it to us to become a disciple or a follower of Yeshua. We may feel we have too much to lose, or that perhaps following him will take more from us than we are prepared to give. To follow him, we may have to make some sacrifices. To keep the Shabbat, for example, entering the synagogue on the Sabbath, like he and the early disciples did, we may be called to forego some entertaining weekend activities or reject certain work prospects. Is that a choice we are willing to make? Is following him more important than anything to us? We have to make a choice. Like the rich young ruler and others in the Gospels, we may choose to walk away. Even though I believe it hurts him deeply when we walk away, he will not force us against our will. He also called us to serve God and others because he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What about prosperity? At a certain point in my Christian life, we attended services at a congregation that was heavily into what is sometimes known as prosperity doctrine or prosperity gospel. The basic premise behind it is that once we accept Jesus or Yeshua as our Lord and Savior, that we get the ability to expect nothing but health, happiness, and financial prosperity. A hidden darker side to that doctrine is the belief that if you're not currently enjoying those things, that there must be something wrong with your walk with the Lord, including hidden sins and a lack of faith. And yes, there is a place for positive thinking and living our lives out for Yeshua and blessings for obedience, which is throughout the Torah and the rest of the scriptures. But sometimes these these kinds of teachings can sometimes border on coveting, like name it and claim it. Or what is worse, in my opinion, is that when you follow him, you won't have any problems at all, and any that you may have will just go away, and things will be rosy for you. However, in my humble opinion, the prosperity doctrine has been one of the most detrimental teachings in Christianity because it ignores the plights of the prophets who suffered, like Job, Jeremiah, etc. It twists or mutilates the words of the apostles of Yeshua, 
like Paul, Peter, and James, and it goes directly in the opposite direction of everything Yeshua taught in the Gospels about suffering for him and becoming his disciples. In Luke 6, 20-26, Yeshua lifted up his eyes towards his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did the fathers to the false prophets. I completely understand that these words are not easy to hear. Does hearing this make us want to follow him, knowing that in following him people will hate us? Like Yeshua said in John 15 and 16, and like Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Messiah Yeshua will suffer persecution. Will we accept his calling to be persecuted, rejected, and poor? That doesn't really sound too appealing, does it? We are mainly taught in modern times to seek the good life. I know that when I was growing up, I thought I had my whole life figured out. I wanted to study and work hard towards my chosen career, climb the ladder of success, and eventually hopefully have an easy and prosperous life where all of my dreams would come true. However, there is a saying, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. There was a point in my life when I felt the Lord tell me that he was going to lead me down a different path and I would have to choose whether to follow him or not. In all honesty, it has not been an easy road, and only he knows how imperfect I am and all of the mistakes I continually make, but I wouldn't change following him for anything in the world. Now I understand how Paul said that he was happy to get rid of everything else in his life that he used to think was important in order to follow the Messiah. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. The ultimate tragedy of the prosperity doctrine is that it gives an inaccurate view of God that he is evil, and that he doesn't care. His loving kindness towards us is eternal, but he does call for us to sacrifice for him in this world, because this world in his current state is only for a short time. Will our lives be more prosperous when we follow Yeshua? I believe that the overwhelming proof from the scriptures is that the short answer to that question is no. To explain a bit further, when I say no, I mean not in the way that we usually think of a good life. We will have abundant life, but I believe that means abundant spiritual life in this world and in the world to come, which is confirmed throughout the scriptures. I don't believe that we are necessarily promised a financially successful, comfortable, or monetarily prosperous life in this world. Yes, some of the patriarchs are very wealthy, many beginning with Abraham through to Solomon, but I believe that if we are blessed with riches, he wants us to use those riches to help others, or even better yet, he would prefer that we give it all away. I believe Abraham and a few others did, and just kept getting continually blessed in return. But as the kings came to power in Israel, their hearts turned towards riches and power, and farther and farther away from God's teachings, and he ultimately took all of their blessings away and sent them into exile. Not everyone can accept this teaching. Some of us may accept him, only to then eventually fall away when things get difficult. Then Yeshua spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then Yeshua explains the parable. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. A common verse that is used in the prosperity doctrine is Third John 1, 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. If you see that verse in context, it's just a greeting, like any that we might make to a loved one. Here, the entire opening and the beginning to the letter of Third John. The elder to the beloved Gaius, 
whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such, that we may become fellow workers for the truth. As you can see, when a verse is taken out of context, it can ruin the intention of the author, and sadly, taking verses out of context is more common than we may like to admit is happening in our day and age. That is why it is so important for us to study the scriptures diligently and constantly seek the truth. We show our love for God by how we keep His commandments. First and foremost, love for others shows our love for Him. 1 John 4, 19-21 states, We love Him because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from Him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. What should we say when God calls? The prophet Isaiah was called to bring God's message to his people. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. Not only Isaiah, but also Jacob, Samuel, and many more prophets, down to the early apostles of Yeshua, and even to this very day, many other men and women of God have answered his call with, Here I am, send me. I hope and pray that when the Lord calls us, we will choose to say, Here I am, and follow him. Our Lord Yeshua has called us to follow him not to follow any person. People are fallible, and ultimately they will fail us. But Yeshua will never fail us. His word is truth, and if we submit to him, things will actually be more difficult. But he will give us his Holy Spirit as our helper and lead us into all truth, so that when he finally returns, we will be handsomely rewarded for our faithfulness and obedience. There's so much more I could say about this topic, but for the sake of time, I tried to keep this video as short as I could. I'm sorry I'm so wordy, and I really appreciate the patience of those of you who have stayed until the end. You truly are a blessing to me. If the Lord is willing, I hope to see you for the next video. May your Vayikra Torah portion Shabbat be blessed. I pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. And may the Lord richly bless all of you and your families.